This is Ian Hartley. I am Warren Kay. And I am Sasha Steenbergen. Welcome to the Rediscovering God Dialogue. We invite you to join us as we endeavor to see Him more clearly. And love Him more dearly while following Him more nearly. Welcome to those of you that are joining us today on this journey to rediscover the God that Jesus knew, and uh, particularly now on our journey through the book of Matthew, and we are in the Sermon on the Mount, which is the second part of the greatest teaching ever heard, and um, the, I think the context is really important to realize that the the church of the day had become very adept at making it clear who was in and who was out. And they basically believed that you had to be a Jew to be in. You had to be a man. You would uh, follow all the ceremonial rituals. You, you would be wealthy and healthy because God was blessing you. And so the very first of the eight attitudes um, that Jesus talks about um, is, is, I think, speaking it to people who were not included, didn't see themselves as included. And Jesus is letting them know that the kingdom that he was part of, they were included. And uh, so the poor in spirit were people that um, could be realized that they were part of this kingdom that he was talking about, the kingdom of heaven. Thanks, Warren, for that introduction. Um, the sermon by Jesus, uh, as Warren mentioned, um, is the most powerful uh, verbal presentation um, that the world has ever heard. And we're still talking about it today. So just we, we're talking about the first section uh, of the sermon, which is recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And we're dealing with the eight uh, beautiful attitudes that are characteristic of the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. or the kingdom of heaven. So last week, we talked about the poor in spirit. And we pointed out that it didn't mean to think poorly of yourself, but it meant that you uh, were open to learning from other people and especially from God. You're not so full of yourself uh, that you have no desire to be blessed by other people. Mm -hmm. And so when you meet someone, uh, you say to yourself, this is a child of God, uh, unique in the universe. And they can tell me something about God that no one else can. So I will listen carefully to what they have to say. Mm -hmm. So we're now going to the second of the eight uh, attitudes. And this one um, uh, goes as follows. Uh, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim the captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent okay, me to all those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Yeah. Thank you. To comfort all who mourn. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're following our uh, pattern is that first we state what the attitude is not, and then we emphasize what it is. So first of all, uh, mourning uh, does not mean that we are sad or depressed. Uh, it also does not mean that we have to be happy all the time. Jesus validates the, our times of mourning. 
Um, he mourned. And we'll get to that a bit later. It does mean that we can mourn. Here are some examples. The suffering of others, our lack of compassion, the way we treated Jesus when he came to earth, our failure to understand the suffering of God, and the emotional or spiritual failure to hear the Holy Spirit. Anything else that comes to mind? You've really broadened the idea of mourning there. Um, because usually we we just think of mourning when we um, are grieving the loss of, of uh, someone close to us. Yeah. But uh, here you've you've broadened it to um, encompass our a realization of our lack in uh, understanding God and what He uh, what He has for us. Mm -hmm. Mourning can, thank you, mourning can be the consequence of the physical or emotional death of friends or family. You know, you, you can lose a family member's um, community uh, if they choose to follow an alternative lifestyle. Uh, or they marry somebody who's hostile towards you. Um these things happen in life. So it's not only physical deaths. And sometimes these emotional sp slash spiritual deaths are just as painful, sometimes even more painful. Yeah. I, so, I learned recently of a, a young lady, uh, she was young at the time, that she made a decision to marry a man who was a vinter. He, he grew grapes. And is actually very adept, very good at uh, growing grapes. And uh, in the Napa Valley, the the vineyard that he was working for, I think for like four or five years running, got the award for the best wine. Uh, and um, but her parents were so um, rigid in their understanding that they basically. Um, said that she wasn't their daughter anymore mm. and 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 they they would have mourned the loss of family and she would have mourned the loss of family as they decided to uh, reject her yeah it was very sad very painful and uh, i would i would mourn for those parents um their picture of god mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they could only do that if they felt that God rejected sinners right. until they repented or uh -huh. reformed or something like that. Those who have glimpsed God's character mourn their lost innocence and purity, their lost access to Eden and their lost sense of purpose. They are confronted with their own moral fallibility. Unfortunately, one futile reaction to loss is anger and frustration when comfort is available. Hmm. So let's talk about this loss of purpose um, for a few brief moments. You know, we have an epidemic of overdoses uh, in North America at present, mm -hmm. uh, which indicates uh, uh, a lack of meaning in life, uh, just nothing to live for. And um, it is because we have lost our sense of identity in God and that we are his precious children and he made us so he could love and serve us. Mm. And when you get that, you automatically pass it on to other people. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, I think um, that there, there can be a, a loss of purpose when a person retires. Now, Sasha doesn't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, you know, when you retire, your whole sense of purpose changes mm -hmm. and you need to find a new purpose. 
and sometimes for some people that can be very difficult and uh, i'm i feel very fortunate that um we are able to do this podcast which gives me a, a sense of purpose in my retirement and uh, and it can continue uh, for many many years because just look at ian he's so much older than i am and he's still able to do this <laughs> amen <laughs> Yeah, I and I want to thank you, Warren, for being the slave driver you are and calling me <laughs> to come up with podcasts. You do bring purpose to my life, sometimes too much. <laughs> <laughs> How do we deal with mourning? Well, Christians is a, Christians are comforted by the Spirit. Um. Jesus said, I will send you another. Now, it depends on your translation as to what he's going to send. The one I like is another comforter. Yes, me too. So um, how does the Holy Spirit do that? Um, by giving us insights into the compassion of God for us. And also by giving us new ideas uh, about how to uh, deal with the life we're living. Mm -hmm. Christians know that there's a new earth coming in which mourning will cease, uh, even though all has not been redeemed. Like the... Uh, Revelation, the end of Revelation says, uh, Behold, I make all things new. Um, well, God is frustrated by some people who will not be renewed because they resist it. So I'm not sure how long we will grieve their loss, but uh, I know we will. Mm -hmm. When we mourn for sin, we are comforted in confession. What do you think? Do you agree? I was going to add in too, when you're talking about mourning um, and uh, just that piece about the human aspect, um, because I think I, I went through an experience that seemingly was quite complicated for me, but um, I had a miscarriage. And it was after a time when I was sort of done having children. And so it was very complicated for me. But anyways, I did end up losing that baby. And um, somehow I didn't think that I deserved to grieve because I had had thoughts that this was not something that I had wanted. Mm -hmm. And so I, I found myself very quickly, um, you know, being like, you know, move on, you know, pull up your, you know, bootstrap, so to speak. And um, feeling guilty about feeling sad um, that I didn't even deserve. And uh, somebody stepped into my space at the time, completely out of the blue. Um, and they had heard about that I had this miscarriage. And so they sat me down and it was a, a father actually. Um, and he had, he just poured his heart out and shared his own experience in their family um, and he just kept saying very strongly, like, you know, that it's important to let yourself feel these things, you know, that it's important, like you matter this, mm -hmm. like, you matter to grieve, like grieving is going to heal you. Um, allow yourself that and I shared my story. And he said, No, 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 like, it, that's human stuff. <laughs> you matter. Um, and I remember it totally changed everything for me because um, I actually went down a road of mourning for myself and allowed that experience to happen. It took a long time um, because I think of the complication for me uh, emotionally. However, it was the most profound experience of somebody loving me in that time. Um, and it'll stay with me forever. <laughs> Um, and that father was just an amazing um, hand of God sort of reached down right into my space. Um, and I'm so grateful for it. And um, yeah, so I feel like uh, God really has obviously touched in his life to be able to share 
a view of God that is like that. So pretty beautiful. And if you had never told anybody, you couldn't have received that comforting. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Or if, or if you had shut that person down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, God provides a lot of comforting for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's, uh, we have to be ready to receive it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, thank you for sharing that, uh, Sasha. Um, we can tell it was uh, a very uh, painful part of your life, but you've dealt with it mm -hmm. with God's help through another human being. Yeah. And I think it, it illustrates the, the healing that, can take place when we do mourn, when we do grieve a loss, uh, it's very healing. And, and we can, even though as difficult as it is at the time, there's, there's new life after yeah. and, and new energy. And uh, so I think it's all part of the journey that we are in. Yeah. And I love that he's, you know, Jesus is specifically speaking to mourning because mm -hmm that healing aspect is so integral in that and that he obviously ultimately wants healing for us. So I love that he addresses it. Yeah. And I think it's, it's encouraging that he realizes that it's part of life. Yeah. We, we don't, the kingdom of heaven is not just glossing over the hard things. Yeah. It's dealing with them. We're moving through them and healing and coming out the other side stronger and and uh, more resilient yeah yeah you know um worship uh is an opportunity to uh deal with our mourning like you can you can just uh have triumphalistic uh worship where you just uh um, Sing about all the good stuffs and the benefit of God. And that's part of it. Yeah. But there's a time for coming in in your morning and giving that to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, often triumphalism doesn't, uh, doesn't deal with our morning. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's good. So when we mourn physical loss, we are comforted by God's compassion. Sasha just gave us a great uh, story about that. Beating yourself up is not mourning. Mm -hmm. That's just a pity party. <laughs> um, we mourn for our loss of innocence and failure, but at the same time, we celebrate our new heart that God has given us. So I want us to read James 5.16, because this is an essential part of mourning uh, in a human being's life. James 5, verse 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Yeah, notice that uh, the confession of sin is to each other. Well, of course, there's, you confess your shortcomings to God and your sin to God. But th this is talking uh, not about, oh, I just robbed a bank uh, and I'm nervous about the cops catching me, um, <laughs> which would be kind of dumb to confess to anybody else. <laughs> this is talking about the challenges we face in our lives. And um, this is what prayer meeting is meant to be. It's this uh, dynamic interaction with each other about how to negotiate life uh, with God on your side. Uh, and um, like what, what, what we need help with. Yeah. 
Well, and I was going to say, I, I got the experience of being able to see Ian in action with a prayer. Uh, it wasn't a prayer meeting per se. It was a, an example of what prayer meeting could be. Um, and everyone in the audience was just moved to tears and everyone said, how do we get this? <laughs> and what the real key that I was blown away by um, was the the vulnerability and the way that Ian asked questions and it didn't leave space for um, sort of trite requests or uh, just other people's stuff. It was like, what's happening with you? What's happening in your heart? What's the space there? And where do you need safety and, and peace from God and to get vulnerable? And I just hold that as that is exactly um, when you when you talked about that's what prayer meeting is, is that feeling of being able to be safe with people and really share actually what's what the challenges of life are and then holding each other with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thanks, Ian. It's really powerful. Thank you for remembering. Mm -hmm. So uh, to wrap this uh, attitude up. Uh, we're going to look at how God mourns, how Jesus mourns, and how the Holy Spirit mourns. Mm. So uh, we're going to read uh, Jeremiah 8, verse 18, the first half. My grief is beyond healing. My heart is broken. And can you read the second half of 21? I mourn and am overcome with grief. So this is actually God talking mm -hmm. over his people. Mm -hmm. So Jesus mourned uh, John eleven thirty five. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings but you wouldn't let me. Yeah, you wouldn't let me. That's Matthew 23, 37. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit also mourns or is grieved. Ephesians 4, verse 30. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. So grieving somebody is causing them to mourn. So, blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. Amen. The only caveat that you need is if they are willing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you can... it's really helpful to realize that God, Jesus, and the Spirit all experience this emotion um yeah that they are they're in this mess with us and they're they're experiencing this emotion uh along with us that's very encouraging and comforting mm -hmm. yeah so you know the greeks uh, the greek gods had no emotions and and one of the great uh, uniqueness uh, says of the the God the Hebrews worshipped was his emotional connection uh, with his people, mm -hmm. and and often we 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 say God is love, uh, and then we shortchange ourselves by saying, well, love is a principle. Well, love is much more than a principle. Mm -hmm. You know, when we say love is a principle, we mean it's unconditional. It's eternal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the way we shortchange ourselves is that it no longer is something you experience. Mm -hmm. It's something your head guides you in, and uh, it it just doesn't comfort you. Yeah. Like if uh, I was teaching about Pythagoras' theorem. Okay. Um, 
it doesn't connect emotionally with you. Mm -hmm. you know? It's it's one of the most useful ideas that's ever been discovered, but <laughs> there's no emotion in it, mm -hmm. and we are emotional beings. Yeah. We're on the the third uh, attitude, and blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now Jesus is has almost a direct quote from Psalm thirty seven eleven. The meek shall inherit the earth, and delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Okay, the meek shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Hmm. Like, I don't know uh, how you guys thought about these sayings that Jesus comes up with. Did you imagine that he just stood up and let the Spirit lead him? Well, I'm not saying he didn't, but what resources did he use? Well, like all of them come from the Old Testament. I had never realized that before. Mm -hmm. Neither I thought. Yeah, good point. Yeah. So meekness does not mean weakness. Oh, good turn of phrase there. Mm -hmm. Or fear or aggressiveness or assertiveness. Jesus is challenging the survival of the fittest mentality. Mm -hmm. Meekness does mean to be secure and strong enough to be teachable. That is willing to learn from others. Meekness is the ability to recognize one's own limitations. When Jesus prays, not my will, but thy will, he displays his meekness. Mm -hmm. Meekness is not striking back when you have the power to do so. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered, according to Hebrews 5, verse 8. So how would that happen? So I've heard about miscarriages, but I've never experienced one personally. Mm -hmm. You know, if I really wanted to understand uh, Sasha in that respect, uh, I'd have to come back as a woman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in going through suffering, uh, Jesus um, learns, which is a euphemism, is that we learn that God understands our suffering. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is a very important idea um, to grasp, is that Often when Jesus says something, it's an ironic statement. When he says, I don't know you, well, he knows everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what he's actually saying is, you don't know me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my favorite story about this is when our grandson was young and used to come and visit us, I'd say to him, you don't need to wear your helmet when you ride your bicycle. Your head is hard enough. <laughs> and he would look at me and smile and go and put his helmet on. <laughs> okay. So um, that probably tells you more about me than about my grandson. <laughs> it's. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't saying his head was hard. What I was saying is you should put your helmet on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The word meek appears more often in the King James Version and in, in the New International Version. In the latter version, the word meek is replaced with gentle. Mm. While meekness is often taken to be the opposite of arrogance, uh, there is more to Jesus' announcement. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Moses was a charismatic, forceful, gifted leader, yet he was meek, according to the King James Version, 
or gentle, according to the new international version. In the context of Aaron and Miriam accusing Moses, he does not defend himself, but depended on God for vindication of his leadership. Moses often had to face this challenge from the time he called the people to leave Egypt up to the time of his death. And it's a good idea to read 1 Corinthians 10 uh, because it catalogues what was happening here. We won't read uh, 13 verses, but we'll read a few verses. 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, starting with verse 1. Uh -huh. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with the most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These ha things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with fa feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites, and don't grumble, as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Thank you. So um, this is what's happening uh, under Moses' leadership. And he could have uh, taken his revenge on them in any one of those instances or encouraged God to do so. Instead, his, uh, he actually offers himself up if somebody has to be punished to take the punishment rather than the people. And this is why uh, it's legitimate even though he's a very forceful person to say that he's meek mm -hmm. or gentle. Um, sorry, I just have to quickly, <laughs> for the people who haven't heard this for long, but can we just also add in that prediction does not equal causation and that God was not punishing the people? <laughs> Do you, do you want to speak more forcefully about this matter? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I will speak very meekly on this. <laughs> <laughs> Can you be meekly passionate? <laughs> no. So Jesus' uh, fellow Jews greatly desired revenge on the Romans. They were not meek. <laughs> yeah. They were not gentle. Eventually, they brought down the wrath of the Romans on them mm -hmm. because they would not accept being colonized by the Romans. And as a consequence, the Romans destroyed their city and their nation. Mm -hmm. And of course, Jesus cringed at the brutality of the Roman soldiers and uh, the way the Romans treated the Jews as second-class citizens. But he never provokes a confrontation. So Jesus was rebuking this desire for retaliation and self-defense in light of God's care for us. So th this is not usually the interpretation of Matthew 6, 25 to 34. But I want us to read it at this point, even though we'll come to it eventually. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? 
Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't they far more val aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wild flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, What shall we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. Thank you. So I think it's safe to say that meekness uh, includes the absence of anxiety. Mm. It seems, yeah, it, it implies the ability to trust. And, and so you don't need to worry. And, and also you don't need to be striving to, to get one up or anything. You're, you're just trusting in what God has provided and will provide. So going back to Moses, um, uh, the meekest man, according to numbers, um, when um, Aaron and Miriam complained about his leadership, um, Miriam ends up getting leprosy. And um, Moses does not celebrate her leprosy as vindication of his leadership, mm. but he prays to God for healing for her. Christ also did not defend himself. And the New Testament often calls attention to the meekness of Jesus and his followers, as in Matthew eleven twenty nine. If we can read that, please. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I'm humble and gentle of heart. Mm -hmm. It's a synonym for meekness. Mm -hmm. What would it mean to be humble of heart? I'm just thinking that we would have an assurance of our identity. And then we wouldn't have to go to all the things that come when we are not sure of our identity, which is all the fear of not being loved, not being seen, not being valued, all of those things. And then that translates out as actions that are not desirable <laughs> to other people. <laughs> yeah. Good. So one of the characteristics of being humble of heart is gratitude for what you have. Mm -hmm. Meekness is to refuse to defend yourself because we know that God is our defense. The meek inherit the earth because they have learned to trust the meek one, the gentle one, who is the creator of the earth and the savior of the world. Meek people do not take revenge. So we need to read Romans 12, 19 to 21, because this passage is uh, misunderstood. Romans 12, 19 to 21. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't conquer evil. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. So here's what happens traditionally with this passage is uh, don't take revenge because God is going to take revenge for you. Mm -hmm. And he's really going to whip them. Yeah. And uh, he'll, he'll burn them for quite a while in hell. So you don't have to burn them now. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. The advice to us is what? 
If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Now, this postulates that we are kinder than God. Hmm. Because he's going to take revenge, but we mustn't. Mm -hmm. do, do you get the problem with that kind of interpretation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like we being held to a higher standard than God. Right. <laughs> well, that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, let's just call it for what it is. Yeah. That is how God takes revenge on his enemies. He meets their needs. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that in uh, chapter 6, the end of chapter 6, where we come to the core teaching of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's mm -hmm. right at the end, uh, sorry, of chapter 5. Okay. Um, we need to make the distinction between defending oneself and defending others. Jesus defended the mothers who brought their children to him. He defended Mary who poured oil on his body and wiped it off with her hair. He defended the widow who gave her might in the temple. He defended his disciples on the night of his arrest. In protecting others, he was being God. God is the protector of the weak and the powerless. Mm -hmm. Amen. So this is a very important distinction to make. It's perfectly legitimate for us to defend other people. And it's advisable that we trust God to defend us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are on the fourth beautiful attitude. And uh, it is as follows. Blessed, which means happy, full of joy, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And Jesus is possibly quoting from Psalm 42, verse 2. My soul thirsts for God. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in education, we have the saying that when the student is ready, the teacher comes. Mm -hmm which means that you cannot teach people who are not interested in what you have to offer. And Jesus will address this a bit later in his colorful metaphor is don't give your pearls to pigs. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Righteousness does not mean we are always right. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. It is much more than not making mistakes or living according to a written or spoken code. It does not mean that we will never have to admit we are wrong. Mm. Righteousness does mean to think right, feel right, and do right. Righteousness is an attribute of God and his Christ. Thus, righteousness, to be very practical, means to be filled with God's compassion, care, and respect for those we meet. Say amen, Sasha. Oh, I'm amening. <laughs> it is, you, this is hard to believe, it is to be prepared to die for the good of another. Mm. So this is what Jesus says in John 13, 34 to 35. We need to read it. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. And you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So I'm, I'm slightly amused when... Uh, different denominations come up with a criteria for being the right denomination. When Jesus gives the criterion here, and he says, if you love each other like I've loved you, people will recognize that you belong to me. Mm -hmm. Righteousness is to stand innocent before the searching eye of the law. 
because if love has taken hold of your heart, it supersedes legal obedience. Mm -hmm. The law never, ever asked us to give our lives for our brothers and sisters. And that's the first thing Jesus does. Yeah. Righteousness is to live by faith. It is purity of thought and motive. Who would not hunger and thirst for such a character on this dark planet? Those who search for this heart will be filled by God. It is his promise. Look, he did it for Peter, James, and John. He did it for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. If he can do it for those six people, he can do it for you. Mm -hmm. Have either of you ever been hungry? I mean, seriously hungry. I mean, like you thought you were dying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't say I've ever been that hungry. No, no, me neither. You know, I was mountain climbing in East Africa and we ran out of food. Oh. And we were 36 hours away from getting off the mountain. I, I, I thought I was going to die. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that's that's my only experience with hunger <laughs> oh that's intense and you know we lived at the end of the road on a farm when i was a boy and my mother used to phone the doctor and say uh, my boys are ill come and see them and he would say are they eating and if she said yes he said i'm not coming <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> so I, I guess that's another experience I had with hunger. <laughs> we have no idea of being hungry or thirsty without hope of food or drink as it was in Jesus' day. Mm -hmm. By the way, do you know why we say grace at a meal? It comes from a time when your meal was not certain. Mm -hmm. And so if you had food, mm -hmm. it was the grace of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. And you thank God for his grace, which is why the prayer you say at a mealtime is referred to as grace. Ah, I like that. Hmm. Good. Know that. Think of the people uh, who experienced famine or death camps and how they felt about food. Mm -hmm. Their physical hunger eclipsed all other desires they had. This hungering means we desire God's character more than anything else we have ever desired. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness means just that. The implication is that one experiences this moral poverty within themselves and longs for deliverance. We are halfway in the eight blesseds, the eight beautiful attitudes. And... Uh, we, we're going to end this uh, podcast. I realize I've just made a executive decision. I've just pontificated, uh, and I've not displayed any meekness at all. <laughs> and I repent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say I am grateful because I am hungering <laughs> <laughs> for real food as well so <laughs> blessings <laughs> and sasha and i in our meekness will surrender to your executive <laughs> amen amen <laughs> for, for mixed motives <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. let's pray together dear god uh you're so inspirational and uh, you want us happy and healthy and holy. Thank you for blessing us. Amen. recording of our podcast on our website, uh, as well as the PDF document that we've been using, so you can follow along or at least see all the passages. And so that website is rediscoveringgod.ca, 
And on there, there is the, the, the PDF document, the uh, link for the podcast, as well as our YouTube link. We are now on YouTube. So if you want to see us live, then you can go and watch it on YouTube. Wonderful. And we'd also love to invite you to our Monday evening Zoom discussion where Ian and Warren lead us out. And um, we are currently going through the podcast uh, where we get to have discussion and really dive in a little deeper and get our, um, our, our most pressing questions answered. Um, it's a really wonderful time of fellowship and connection with the group. Um, we share in community and resources as well. We'd really love to have you join us. We're going to be meeting um, at 6.30 Mountain Standard Time. Uh, you just add in the link 403-506-9201. We'd love to see you. And if you'd like to connect with us, you can reach us at rediscoveringgod2020 at gmail.com. Send us an email. We'd love to hear from you and know how this journey of rediscovering the God that Jesus knew is changing your life. Take care.